This is topic 5.5 and 5.6 from the course and exam description for AP Environmental Science. Go ahead and follow along with your study guides as we go through these learning objectives. The first learning objective is at the top of your screen. The first one that says EIN-2.E, I can describe the different methods of irrigation, comes from the course and exam description from the College Board. The other one right here is a little bit more specific. Okay, so irrigation we can kind of think of um, in our terms <clears throat> as sprinkler water. So how you water your front and your back lawns or your planter beds or things like that. So farmers, so most of what we'll talk about focuses on farming and agriculture and farmers use groundwater, so underground in our aquifers, and surface water, which is like rivers and streams and ponds and lakes, and they can pump that for irrigation. So in the world, most fresh water is used for agriculture, 70% for agriculture. In many developing countries, including the, uh, the United States, most fresh water is used for industry, but quite a lot is used for agriculture. So a review of some terms here. Groundwater is stored underground in the pore spaces. So you learned about the porosity of soil last unit when you learned about soil. There's also porosity in other things like gravel and rock layers underground too that have even larger pore spaces. And within, if there's like this layer of an area that water can store, it's called an aquifer. Now, sometimes aquifers are what's called unconfined. And what that means is that you can access it easily. There's no like this sheet of, of solid rock, we can call that bedrock, um, that uh, is above the aquifer, which makes it hard to drill into. If there is an impermeable rock or clay layer, it's called a confined aquifer and you have to drill through that to be able to access the groundwater. And then um, the top level underground of the underground water, whether it's an aquifer or just groundwater, is called the water table. Okay, so we can see some things here. So if we have this aquifer, which is more shallow, it's unconfined, you can drill right down and get to it. This one, is a confined aquifer, it's lower. In our California drought, there are some teachers at my school who lived on well water. Most of us here in the city live on municipal water, which means that we don't have our individual wells. But if you live further out um, away from the city on some property, many people have well water. Well, during the California drought, um, one of our teachers, their well that was a little bit shallower, ran dry. So they had to spend about $60,000 to drill one that went lower to access a deeper source of groundwater. Okay, oh, going back real quick, um, we have our recharge area. So these are places that can fill the aquifers. A lot of times there's river streams, lakes, etc., that can soak in. And here's another picture right here of the same kind of process. <clears throat> okay, so water as it percolates through soil, sometimes we call it percolation, sometimes we call it seepage, it creates groundwater recharge. That's a term that will be used on the AP test, groundwater recharge. Now, sometimes in low places, the water can come out of the ground and it's called a spring. And um, then you have something called an artesian well, and that one really isn't on the AP test anymore, but it's kind of an interesting thing um, to know about an artesian well. And well water takes a long time to recharge because if the deeper levels of water are, take a long time to fill back up. So if you are, because they have to go down in, in slow recharge areas past Per impermeable layers of rock, so they can take a long time to recharge if you over pump them. Okay, water is a renewable resource, so it does replenish, but it 
takes a little while, especially if there's a drought. So sometimes you have to wait for that recharge. And then if we overuse water in general, whether it's groundwater, surface water, it, we can use it faster than the water cycle through precipitation can recharge it. And in that way, we have to focus on water conservation. Okay, the total daily per capita, the word per capita means per person, for a person um, is called a water footprint. In the U.S., a third of our fresh water is irrigation, so that's lower than the global average of 70%. And our other large uses of water is for our livestock because the United States eats a lot of meat. Okay, so here's water for irrigation. I'm sorry, water withdrawal per inhabitant. So you can see the U.S. and Canada uses the most water here in red. So do some other places on the world. And you can see that there's other places that use less water per person. Now, when we're talking about water per person, such as shower water, it's also the water used to create our goods, to give to the cattle that we then eat as meat. Um, in the factories to make our things, they need water to cool machinery. Um, in power plants to create electricity, we need water to cool the machinery as well. So that all goes into an individual person's water footprint. Okay, so now let's talk about irrigation. So there's four types of irrigation, furrow, flood, spray, and drip. And so make sure that you um, know your uh, other notes about these types of irrigation. Furrow is trenches filled with water. You have a lot of water loss there. Flood irrigation, you flood the field, you have a lot of water loss from evaporation and erosion. Spray irrigation is what we think of as sprinklers. It's what most people have in their landscaping around town. Um, it has less water loss, um, but the best one in terms of preventing water loss is drip irrigation, slow dripping water through hoses. It is the most expensive though, so that's a drawback with that. Okay, so here's some things to know. Which irrigation method loses the most? You have to know it's furrow. Which loses the least? It's drip. What can lead to the most soil erosion? It's flood. Which one is more likely for soil salinization that we're going to learn about um, here in a little bit? It's called furrow. Which irrigation type is best on sandy soil? Drip irrigation. Okay, so here we have something called water logging. That's when um, the water is covering the roots right here. You can have root rot where the roots actually are decomposed by bacteria, but it also prevents gas exchange. So the roots of these plants can't get carbon dioxide and can't release oxygen. Okay, the next environmental problem to talk about here is soil salinization. So you can see some picture here of salts that are left behind. So it happens with irrigated water, not rainwater, Irrigated water is the key to soil salinization. Irrigated water, sprinklers, flood, furrow, hardly ever with drip, drips a solution for soil salinization. Um, the water, the irrigated water evaporates, evaporates, that's a key word too. Irrigated water evaporates and leaves behind salts. Okay, um, it's tiny amounts, but when you have 30, 40 years of and this happens in California a lot, we didn't have much agriculture, especially in the middle of our state, until irrigation was invented. It was just too dry here. Well, now the whole state of California can grow, well, not the whole, much of California. That used to not be particularly fertile because of the lack of water. Now with irrigation, we can water, and we are the largest agricultural state in the country. But in most of it's irrigated water, and so we have soil salinization problems because now it's been 50, 60, 70 years of using irrigated water. And so now we have buildup of salts in the soil. So they can evaporate. Again, irrigated water evaporates. <clears throat> Tiny amounts that build up over decades. Okay, so how do we prevent this from happening? Drip irrigation heart has very little evaporation. That can prevent it. We can water at night when the sun's not out, so less evaporates. You can also plant crops that need less water, so less evaporates. How do you fix salinization? So if you have a salinized field with soil, 
How do you fix it? So mitigating is fixing. You, if you have a huge rainy season, like in California, we have El Nino years where we have lots and lots and lots of water. You can flush the field with large amounts of water. But in drought years or normal years, that's not available to do. Okay, what's a way to deal with salinized soil? You can plant salt crop, tolerant crops like barley. So here's a picture here of drip irrigation. This is a picture of barley. Now, you have to know the difference between preventing, mitigating, and dealing with. Those are very separate questions. So on a free response question, which one did it ask you? Because there's different ways that you prevent, there's a different way to mitigate, and there's a different way to deal with your salinized soil. Okay, here's a little picture here. This is called the Ogallala Aquifer. It's the largest one in the country. I don't know about the world, I can't remember. But it's huge, it covers parts of Nebraska, Kansas, Colorado, New Mexico, and we have um, massive depletion of this aquifer um, because of irrigation when irrigation was invented and the picture here just shows different problems with that um, process okay we have this one already okay here's the next little picture to kind of understand aquifer depletion if multiple users of an aquifer do not regulate use and cone of depression expands you can see what this is called which lowers the water source for all. This is an example of tragedy of the commons if your water table is owned in common. In some places of the country, especially the Western United States, people own water rights to certain things, but if a community owns the water rights or many people own the water rights, especially in the Eastern United States, and it's not regulated, you can end up with these problems. Okay, let's go on to pests. All right, so pesticides. Um, are meant to reduce pests and you can have some consequences. So let's go through these things. We have four categories of pesticide, fungicide or fungus, rodenticide to kill rodents. And then there's also insecticide for insects, but we wrote those in our notes as well. And herbicides for weeds. Persistent pesticides stay in the environment for decades. And then non-persistent pesticides do not. Um, and then an alternate is integrated pest management, which we'll go into a lot more later in the unit. Okay, so here's the pesticide treadmill. So what happens is that when a, pesti a pesticide is sprayed on the field, right here, most pests die, but some resistance do not. Those ones who are resistant breed, and now you've got that resistant genes in their offspring. So now all the babies are going to be resistant. Then the farmer has to spray a more powerful pesticide to kill off most of them, but then a few live through genetic mutation that makes you stronger DNA. You pass that on to your offspring, and around and around it goes. It's called the pesticide treadmill. Okay, so one way to reduce pesticides is through genetically modified organisms. Um, so we can put genes in that are pesticide resistant genes from one species of plant to another. So strains of crops can be modified to release toxins to pests so they can't eat the crops. Another way is to make crops herbicide tolerant. So this is called a Roundup Ready crop. Um, that crops can be sprayed with the herbicide, but the crops won't die, but the, the weeds will. Okay, so this won't reduce the use of pesticide, but can save more crops. Okay, so um, let's talk about meat production. Actually, going back to the previous slide, meat production will be on the next video. So um, this video is done for these two topics.